lot of people do this time of year that we don't do near as much any other time of the year. So what was that? Give. Oh, that's a good one, especially today, but that wasn't the answer I was looking for. What else? Resolutions. Yep, that's true, but I'm not going to talk about New Year's resolutions either. What? Love? That's good. It's a good thing to do this time of year, and, and I would encourage you, practice it more. But not shopping? Yeah, well, hopefully we've quit that by this time. <laughs> Enough of that last week. Uh, what did many of you do uh, yesterday from about 2 o'clock on? Watch football. There are bowl games on right now. Oklahoma got crushed. Okay, and Ohio lost a heartbreaker. All right. Um, but we, we watch a lot of football this time of year. Bowl. <laughs> Anybody going to watch a game about 5 o'clock this afternoon? Amen. <laughs> yeah. I hear Seattle's playing somebody. But um, January 1st was always, for me as a kid growing up, the granddaddy of all bowl games. And that was the Rose Bowl. And it still has a great deal of prestige, all right? Still, still played on January 1st. Uh, we have folks from Clovis who've been down there already for 48 hours, and they have been putting the flowers on the floats. Uh, Secret Garden, their staff, several of their staff have been going for decades uh, doing that, and, and part of them are down there right now. Uh, but this time of year is big for bowl games. It's a great part of the American tradition at New Year's is to watch the Rose Bowl. Well, there was one man who actually lived out the college dream of a college football player, and that was he got to play in the Rose Bowl. His name is Roy Regals. Some of you may have heard of him. He got to play in the 1929 Rose Bowl. Do you remember him, Dad? He was able to play in that great game. Now, Roy Regals was a stud. He played for the University of California, Berkeley. He was the center on offense and the equivalent to a middle linebacker on defense. He started both directions. He was an all-American player. In 1929, he got to play in the Rose Bowl. Not only did he get to play center, but he actually got his hands on the football and ran over 90 yards and missed a touchdown by three yards. What happened is after he had centered the ball to his quarterback, his quarterback got hit and fumbled the ball. And Roy Regals picked it up and was heading to the end zone for what would be a touchdown. He got hit a couple of different times and got turned around and he ran 92 yards in the wrong direction. <laughs> and he got tackled by his quarterback <laughs> three yards short of the goal line. His team then decided to punt the ball from their end zone rather than risk a safety. The punt was blocked, and they got a safety anyway. Roy Regals did not want to come out for the second half. He wanted to stay in the locker room. His coach persuaded him, and he had the game of his life in the second half. The end of the story, I wish I could tell you it was a Paul Harvey great ending. But they lost that game 9-7. to seven. The difference was the two-point safety because of that run that ended up in a safety on the punt. They ended up losing the game. You see, uh, there were two problems with that run of Roy Regals that day. One is he ran in the wrong direction. Secondly, he got tackled by the wrong team, his own. However, as I look at that and I think about it, being tackled by his own teammate was a good thing. You see, when we're going in the wrong direction, it's those who are on our team who need to get us turned around, need to stop us from going in the wrong direction. There's been something that God has used in my life for, well, almost 30 years now. 
to get me back on track when I've gone the wrong direction. It's something that we've attempted to use at New Hope as well. As staff, and I trust as a church body, we don't talk about it often. We talked about it a lot as we endorsed it and accepted it as our vision statement at New Hope nearly 30 years ago. We've talked about it at various times. I've preached from it. Probably the last time was about seven years ago. I'm going to do it again today. as so we wrap up 2019 and launch into a brand new decade of ministry. If you, uh, if you had your phones and if you, you Google things, you can Google New Hope Community Church and you'll find our website will show up. On that page, if you flip to the very bottom of that first page, where it has service times, our vision statement is right there. And the vision statement of New Hope is to compellingly communicate to everyone. In the original version, we made it a little longer. We said to any man, woman, boy, or girl, wanting to include everyone, <laughs> to compellingly communicate to everyone who God provides us the opportunity, the all-absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ, who meets our every need. Think on that for a few minutes. There was a young baker who was driving his BMW in the mountains and he got hit by a snowstorm. As he rounded a turn, his vehicle hit some black ice, slid out of control and was heading towards a cliff. At the last moment, he was able to unbuckle his belt and jump out his door. Though he escaped with his life, his left arm got caught on the hinge of the door and it tore it from his shoulder. A trucker passing by witnessed the accident. He stopped his rig and he ran back to see if he could help the gentleman. There standing in a state of shock was the banker at the edge of the cliff moaning. Oh no! My BMW! My BMW! The trucker then pointed to the shoulder and said, man, you've got a bigger problem than your car. And with that, the banker looked at his shoulder. Finally realizing he had lost his arm, he began moaning again. Oh no, my new Rolex, my new Rolex. By the way, this is not a Rolex. It's a kissing cousin to a Timex. The pull of the world can easily steal our affections away from what really is important and prompt us to live for the wrong things. Now, now don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you that stuff is bad, that a Rolex or a BMW is something that you shouldn't have. No, 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 no. E evil is not in the stuff or the possessions or the things. Evil is in the attitude that we may have towards those things. And evil may exist in the lack of attitude towards people. That's why this vision statement is so extremely important. You see, the important thing is the people that God gives us the opportunity to connect to in our lifetime. Ravi Zachariah. Ravi Zachariah may be, in my opinion, the most powerful voice for faith in the world right now. With Billy Graham in heaven, with Chuck Colson in heaven, Ravi Zachariah is a gifted communicator. He is, uh, uh, he's, an, he's an Indian with a British accent. Uh, he is, I could compare him to C.S. Lewis in intellect with a much better ability to communicate difficult truths in a very understandable way. And Ravi Zachariah tells an amazing story of a young Christian from Vietnam Ravi writes, I was ministering in Vietnam in 1971, and one of my interpreters was, was Han Pham, an energetic young Christian. He had worked as a translator with the American forces and was of immense to help both to them and to missionaries such as myself. Han and I traveled the length of the country, and we became very close friends by the time I returned home. We did not know if our paths would ever cross again. But 17 years later, I received a phone call. Brother Ravi? The man asked. Immediately, I recognized Hen's voice, and he soon told me a story. Shortly after Vietnam fell, Hen was imprisoned on accusations of helping the Americans. 
His jailers tried to indoctrinate him against democratic ideals and his Christian faith. He was restricted to communist propaganda in French or Vietnamese every day. The daily deluge of Marx and Engels began to take its toll. Maybe, Hen thought, maybe I've been lied to. Maybe God does not exist. Maybe the West has deceived me. So Hen determined that when he awakened the next morning, he would not pray anymore or think about his faith ever again. The next morning, Hen was assigned the dreaded chore of cleaning the prison latrines. As he cleaned out a tin can stuffed with toilet paper, his eyes caught what seemed to be English printed on a piece of paper. He hurriedly grabbed it, he washed it, and after his roommates had retired for the night, he retrieved that paper and he read the words, Romans chapter 8. And trembling, he began to read. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. For I am convinced that nothing shall separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He broke down and wept at his bed that night. He knew his Bible. And he knew that there was not a more relevant passage for one on the verge of surrendering his faith than this passage. Hen cried out to God, ask his forgiveness for doubting. For this was to have been the first day that Hen would not pray. After finding the scripture, Hen asked his commander if he could la clean the latrines daily. Can you imagine asking for that assignment? And why did he do that? Because he discovered that there was some Vietnamese official who was using the Bible like my dad's generation used to use the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Using it for toilet paper. And he would pull it out and clean it and read it nightly. You see what his tormentors were using for refuge. The scriptures could not be more treasured by him. Eventually, he was released from prison. Hen fled to Thailand. And today, Hen is a businessman here in the United States and a radiant Christian and living testimony to the power of God's word and its transforming work in our lives. So folks, if God can use a piece of toilet paper to compellingly communicate his sufficiency to a prisoner of war, can't God use you and me to do the very same thing with the resources he has provided to us and the opportunities that he brings our direction? I suggest to you, you are far more valuable than a piece of toilet paper. I suggest to you, you are far more useful to God than a piece of toilet paper. But remember, God can take the all things that includes toilet paper and you and me for his purpose. So let's talk about this vision statement a little bit. What's the description that we find in that statement? The description is a quality of communication that is to be compelling. Compelling is an adjective. It is a descriptive word. That word defined as we are to evoke interest, attention, or admiration in a powerfully irresistible way. It's very similar to what Peter would talk about later on in his writings. Be ready to give everyone an answer for the hope that is within you. Because is there anything more compelling than hope? When everything goes bad, hope is a bright light in a dark spot. Some interesting statistics. Just Googled them this week, so they're pretty current. This comes out of an article in 2018. 95% of Christians have never led one person to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands to see if, where we fall in the percentile. 
But 95%, that means only 5% of the people who say they are Christians have ever had the privilege of praying with somebody else about this incredible moment that happened in their own life and to lead them into that experience. Wow. Added to that statistic is this. 80% of all Christians have never witnessed, period. 80% of us who say we are believers have never shared this incredible, life-transforming, hope-giving relationship that we have with anybody else. What would it be like to get married and not tell 80% of the people that you know that you're married? Hmm. Less than 2% of Christians are involved in any kind of ministry of evangelism. 71% of Christians never give toward financing the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Now here's the deal, folks. If you put a dollar in today's offering, you are no longer part of that 71%. All right, you just helped with the Great Commission, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, Jesus tells the story. Actually, he tells three stories. They're the three lost parables. I could probably ask you and you'd figure out what those three parables were. Uh, first, there is the story, the parable of the lost sheep. One goes missing and the shepherd leaves the 90 and 9 and goes looking for the one that is lost. And then there is the story of the lost coin. And then last of all is the story of the lost son. Jesus is explaining to the Pharisees why he hangs out with riffraff. See, the Pharisees were complaining that Jesus spent a lot of time with publicans and sinners. <gasps> And Jesus said, hey, a shepherd would go looking for a lost sheep. An adult would go looking for a lost money. And a father would go looking for a lost son. I have come to seek and to save all who are lost. What these three parables have as common threads are three things. First, that that which is lost matters. Second, that that which is lost warrants an all-out search. And number three, there is a cosmic celebration of one that is lost when they are found. Heaven throws a party. Do you realize you never lock eyes with anybody? From family member to stranger in a grocery store line. We never lock eyes with anybody who doesn't matter to Jesus. We never brush shoulders with someone who doesn't matter to Christ. And this thing called evangelism is really telling people that they matter to God. The love of Christ is at work and that it is contagious. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, the good news. Though I am free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. What a thought process. I would say that Paul would like New Hope's vision statement to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ to anyone that God gives us the opportunity. Paul writes again in 2 Corinthians 5, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Most of us in this room have been drawn into a relationship with God because John 3 16 for God so what? Love that he gave his only begotten son. His love drew us, compelled us to come into a relationship with him. So, so 
Paul takes that another step. This compelling love that drew me to Jesus is now a love that compels me to share my love of Jesus with somebody else. Um, that's the description. Compelling. Uh, what's the action in this place? The action is communicate. That's the verb. Uh, it means to share or exchange information, news, or ideas. And, and here is where Peter, that disciple, is right on track. 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Jesus as Lord. Always be prepared. How often? Be prepared. So have you ever thought about this? Because we have to think about it to be prepared. It doesn't happen by accident. Always be prepared to give, to share an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have and do this with gentleness and respect. Peter makes some assumptions when he writes this. He makes an assumption that people who have experienced the love of God in their life reflects a life of hope. And so when people look at your life filled with hope, you don't even have to Ask them a question to start the conversation. They'll ask you a question about why do you have hope? And be ready to give an answer. You don't have to be theologically sound. You don't have to know every answer in the Bible to say why you have hope. I know Jesus Christ. I can't tell you everything that's in the Bible, but you want to know why I have hope? It's because there was a moment in my life where I gave my life to him. I confessed to him what a failure, what a sinful person I was. And you know what? He loved me so much anyway. He lives in me. And every day, he provides my needs as I trust him. Period. Boom. Bam. There's your answer. But you got to think that through. And then you've got to live it through. Because if you live it, they'll see it, and then they'll ask. Wow, that is so cool. What's the target audience for this vision statement? In our revised one, it's everyone. In the original, it was man, woman, boy, or girl. That's why Jesus said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world. Anybody left out on that? That's every man, that's every woman, that's every boy, that's every girl. Luke writes for us in Acts chapter 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In other words, stop standing here doing nothing. Go tell them about Jesus. Jesus said to them in Matthew 28, 18, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I am with you always to the very end of the age. The source of this privilege whom God provides us the opportunity to serve. You don't have to create opportunities. God provides them for us every single day. Paul writes in Galatians 6, 12, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Paul writes again in Ephesians 5, Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of what? Every opportunity, because these days are evil, because they're evil, there's lots of opportunities. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of his Son. In Colossians 4, 5, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. And then last of all, the life-transforming relationship. The vision statement says the all, absolute sufficiency of New Hope Church. Mm -mm. The all, absolute sufficiency of a mature disciple believer. The all, absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so Christ's power in me. 
Paul also writes in Romans chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets of the scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, who through the spirit of holiness appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all people to the obedience that comes from faith in his name. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. When we admit our weaknesses, the strength of God comes in us and he transforms our weakness into his strength. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, are you a recipient of God's mercy? If you have received his forgiveness, you are a recipient of his mercy. So if you have received his mercy, offer your bodies, your life, as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Transforming power of God at work in us as we share in the opportunities that God provides, not the ones we create, the ones he provides, the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Bill Irwin is a man who is blind. And Bill Irwin has a talking computer. And this is the way Bill Irwin studies the Bible. His computer reads the Bible to him. His computer reads devotions to him. His computer reads commentaries to him. He's had a few chuckles over the way his computer pronounces some of the words in Scripture. For a long time, Bill says, the computer pronounced Holy Bible as Holly Bibble. <laughs> he said, until I figured out how I could modify so that it would pronounce it correctly. He said, but there was one thing that I could not change. The computer uses the Spanish pronunciation for Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. The programmer was Hispanic. And he made sure that Jesus Christ could not be altered. I like that. Because it reminds me that among the things in life that can be changed to suit our tastes, there is one that remains tamper-resistant. We cannot change Jesus to who we want him to be. In preparing for yesterday's memorial service for the piano and voice coach, I came across this little illustration. There was a man who came to his old friend who had been his music teacher, and he asked him, what's the good news today? The old music teacher was silent as he stood up, walked across the room. He picked up a small hammer and he struck a tuning fork. As the note sounded out through the room, he said, Sir, that is A. It is A today. It was A 5,000 years ago. And it will be A 10,000 years from now. The soprano who lives upstairs she sings off key. The tenor who lives across the aisle from me, he can't hit the high notes. And the piano downstairs hadn't been tuned in years. He struck the tuning fork again and said, but this is A, my friend, and that's the good news for today. This is is Jesus. He was the same yesterday, 5,000 years ago. He will be the same 10,000 years from now. The scripture says he changes not. And what was good in our past and what is good for our future will be absolutely great for us today. And that is the good news that we have to share with the world. When life is unsettled, I gain great comfort from the Bible's affirmation that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today, and tomorrow. But the statement is also a stern rebuke to my tendency 
to want to modify the character of Christ to fit what I might like. How easy it is to forget that I came to Christ longing for him to transform me, not the other way around. Praise God that his word and his love and his character are perfect and unchanging. And praise him too that in his love, he works to change each and every one of us. We have our marching orders for the coming decade to compellingly communicate the all-sufficient, absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ to everyone that God provides us the opportunity. Let's seize those moments. Let's pray. Father, if any of us have picked up a fumble and we have started running the wrong direction, in all the chaos of life, it's easy to get bumped and jostled and spun around. I pray there'll be somebody in my life who will tackle me, turn me around, and get me sent in the right direction. Father, I pray that each of us will give your presence in us, the Holy Spirit, to be the tackler and to remind us regularly when we began to head in the wrong direction, to remind us when we began to try to reshape Jesus into someone he is not, that we need to let him shape us into someone who is. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.